A month ago on Saturday, November the 2nd, I enjoyed part of your retirement gift to me, that being your giving me the means to go to a game of my choice, which turned out to be the University of Washington Huskies playing the Utes of the University of Utah in Seattle. Sadly, we lost. <laughs> However, we beat Washington State on Friday, so by God, it's been a perfect season. <laughs> Nevertheless, I had an absolute blast with Elizabeth Wilson and her fiance Michael, as well as Kimmons and her beloved Philip, who happened to be sitting in the second and third pew from the back. Following our taking our seats, we watched a remarkable tribute to our nation's veterans, and then the game began. An hour into it, while we were still winning, Philip, who it is useful to know actually is from Germany, said, Look! There's Jordan Miller. This fellow sitting just three or four rows down from us prompted my response. Who's Jordan Miller? Well, he plays defense for Atlanta Falcons, said Philip. Turns out that he was also quite the star for the University of Washington Huskies last year. And along with being an extraordinarily accomplished football player, he's an exemplary person. And so for the remainder of the game, I paid attention to the fact that lots of folks his age, maybe a little bit older or younger, were coming up to him for handshakes and hugs. He seemed to know them well, sharing greetings and getting caught up with what was going on in their lives. So many were so happy to see him in the stands. Here I am, with more husky memorabilia and clothing than probably most people who have graduated from the place. The little gizzies on my tire for the tire air pressure have a W in them. That's how bad it is. I pride myself for not being surpassed by any fan, and I had not a clue about this guy, and yet there he was, about 65,000 of my closest personal friends enjoying a game in my proximity on a sunny, warm day in the Pacific Northwest. I got so excited about it, I text Sam a photograph of the guy and said, look, Jordan Miller, and I don't remember if you said who's Jordan Miller either. <laughs> you, you made a remark about his hair, but other than that. Now the question is, what does all this have to do with Advent? Plenty. Advent is a time in which we wait to meet and greet the one who's been there all along. Remember in the beginning was the word? Advent is also a time to open our eyes even wider than they may have been to see who it is right in front of us that may be serving as an image of Jesus in our midst. Likewise, Advent is the season in which it's a good idea to listen to others point out to you a whole different sighting of the Savior than you might be accustomed to seeing. And Advent is also a time to listen to those who just might surprise you. Remember, Philip who caused me to see this, Jordan, for the first time, arrived four years ago from a country in which football is played with a round ball that's kicked all over the place by players who are not, for some reason or another, wearing any kind of padding, while those annoying horns known as vavusalas <laughs> blow incessantly throughout the entire match, driving every single person to distraction. That's football for them, yet he informed me about here. Now, with the above image, now safety lodging in the back of your mind, let me turn to our reading from Matthew this morning. To get the context of it, it's kind of helpful to return to the gospel that our friend Bill Baumgarten preached on on November 17th. Remember from two weeks ago how impressed the disciples were about the large stones that were comprising the temple. Look how large and beautiful they are, Master. But then Jesus said to them that one day those very stones would fall one on top of another into rubble. The shocked disciples asked when that would occur, and Jesus replied, telling them in ways quite ominous and dreadful how the end would look, concluding basically with the words in the reading that we heard this morning. <coughs> He said that they needed to be ready, for the Son of Man was coming at an hour that no one expected. Man, I think if I had heard the same from our Lord, I would have just run home, curl up in a corner, and hid. 
And the reason for that, of course, would have been that nearly everything I could think of as being familiar and comfortable and reassuring and reliable and meaningful was going to take a hit. This morning we got just a sample of much the same found in the preceding 30 or so verses, basically predicting excruciatingly hard times ahead. And yet, though our reading this morning can seem disturbing and even terrifying, a companion taken away while one is left, or floods devastating the earth, or a thief breaking in at an unannounced time, you and I cannot help but read the Bible backwards. We know that through the resurrection everything was changed and that we were le released from the power of sin and the sting of death, every single one of us. New life became the rule of the day again for every single one of us, no exceptions. And as a result of that realization, you and I can look at this morning's movie playing itself out and, and just yell at the scream, hey you disciples, don't despair. Your Savior is standing right in front of you. Sort of like Jordan Miller was but a few rows below me in the stands at the University of Washington game. The twelve might not realize it, but the end has already come to the old way of doing business, and it's come because the one in your midst has tossed the law aside and simply has called us to love one another as friends. That's the totality of it. For that matter, even the crucifixion to come will not derail, derail his binding you and all of us to him. That's what we want to tell the disciples. In our lives, societal, political, and yes, occasionally even in the realm of the faith, it can seem shaky, and sometimes it can feel as if the entire world is just crashing in on us. As an obvious example, for the fourth time now in our nation's history, we are in the midst of the impeachment of a president, which has shaken up the country regardless of how you view the proceedings or upon which side of the political fence you find yourself standing. It seems that some of the temples that we have constructed, political and otherwise, to house the very institutions and norms upon which we bank, are finding their stones falling. And why not? It's been doing that for 2,000 years. As well, even people we lean upon can disappear from view, not unlike that beloved high school counselor and coach, late of Glacier High School two weeks ago. Life can be tough, be very tough, and being but 20 days away from the darkest day of the year does not help. We get a reprieve, it's sunny outside right now. And so when it's gloomy, we are called to look for hope, and we are called to wait for a savior, which is a very common understanding of Advent, but the good news actually is that just about the time that we begin to grow accustomed to the coming of the Christ child being three weeks and three days away, sign that, well, certainly we can last that long, thank God. God makes God's way into our field of vision and points to Jesus in our midst, right now, right here, maybe but a couple of rows down from our seats, greeting those who know him as a friend and not as a stranger. In other words, unlike the disciples front and center in today's reading from the gospel, we really don't have to wait for anything. He's here. What I'm suggesting in all of this is that Advent is a time to prepare to see anew the one who has been here and forever will be here. And yes, that can seem a bit complicated in that Advent also summons us to juggle all sorts of thoughts. While thinking of Mary and Joseph heading to Bethlehem, she pregnant and he missing work as a carpenter for that enrollment thing in the census, we're also called to similarly embrace an awareness of an image of Jesus right now and here in the person of someone who maybe looks a lot like Jordan Miller or you or me. And we're called to do that because just as was the case 2,000 years ago when things were not going smoothly, and yet Jesus remained steadfast with his friends, 
you and I find ourselves in the exact same circumstances, commissioned now to be the embodiment of compassion and grace, forgiveness, generosity, acceptance, forbearance, hope, understanding, and here's the big one, having the ability to raise the dead in spirit to life. Yes, Christmas is indeed coming and we await its arrival with great joy. But today, in response to those desperately looking for Jesus, the touch that we just felt on our shoulder was God the Father pointing you and me towards the captive and the despondent and those suffocating from judgment saying, Tag, you're it. Now go be my son's body and refresh the world. It needs him more than ever, you know. So may we be easily recognized as such in whatever stadium of life we happen to find ourselves. For that, dear friends, is exactly how hope finds a way to always conquer despair. Amen. Amen.